Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Yes, had to look up there and see. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining me on a special day, a special time, special everything. We are live. Adobe Live is always live, and it's my pleasure to be streaming to you live from rainy Atlanta. So um, the Adobe Studios are like vacant right now, but we're the show must go on, and we're going to keep doing this. As long as, as long as there's power and internet and the zombie apocalypse hasn't happened yet. So welcome everybody. Uh, so great to see so many of you here. It's been a while since I've been on the official Adobe Live and happy to be back and also happy to be doing it um, from the comforts of my live streaming studio here in Atlanta. Uh, great to see all the folks joining me so far. I saw Deb, I saw Victoria, I saw Paco, I saw uh, Gus, I saw Paul Tranny, I saw Arturo and Marissa, and Tim, and Alexandri, and Noor, and Alberto, and everyone else joining. Carol, if I missed your name, I'm sorry that I missed your name, but I will probably see it later. Uh, Carrie, people joining from all over the world, it's great to see so many of you here today. And um, we're going to do some digital imaging. We're going to do all kinds of things, primarily portrait retouching for the next couple of hours. But we're going to um, answer some questions, uh, just talk about things that people always ask, uh, people that have asked, things that people have asked lately. Uh, as many of you already know, I have a, a new photography show on Adobe Live on Friday mornings at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern, every Friday. So I've been doing uh, kind of getting people caught up on the whole photography workflow there. Uh, we'll be doing live shoots on that show as well as, as I'm sure if I'm back on Adobe Live, um, uh, not if, when I'm back on Adobe Live from my home studio, we'll probably work in some shoots there as well. Um, so with that said, uh, today, again, the main focus is portrait retouching, but we're going to touch on Lightroom, we're going to touch on Photoshop, we're going to touch on a little bit of compositing, a little bit of like, how do I cut an image out? How do I make an image look better? What to what to retouch and what more importantly, what not to retouch? Uh, retouching is like is like adding uh, salt to your food. You can overdo it and then you just ruin the whole dish. So you can do the same thing with retouching. If you overdo it, it can make the whole picture just a bad thing and, and make the subject feel bad when they see it because they feel like, why did they need to retouch and over retouch my image? Um, so I will be, as, as uh, Adobe Live has just said, I will be taking a look at a little bit later on the submissions today for the Adobe um, Creative Challenge. Uh, so those are, um, the, I'm sorry, daily challenge, the daily creative challenge, which I believe today's challenge was uh, creating a nine slice image using the slice tool for your Instagram. So I'm interested to see what you guys have submitted for that. And of course, if you feel like showing me a before or after retouch between now and the end of the show, I'd happily look at those as well. Uh, so with that said, if you, just one more caveat, if you are watching this um, on YouTube, Hi, YouTube. I see you over there. I see you, Anissa. Uh, if you're in the YouTube chat, that's pretty much all you're going to get today because I'm looking at the Behance chat. So head over to behance.net slash live. That's where all the action is. That's where everything's taking place. And that's where the, um, the real chat will take place. So um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my sponsors today. I am sponsored today by Perel. If you just feel like you still need to handshake and shake hands and touch people, you know, might want to grab a bottle of Perel. And of course, just in case you want to stock up on Angel Soft, the softest toilet paper known to man, known to man and woman. I am kidding. These are not sponsors. I just thought I'd 
throwing a little COVID-19 humor in this as well. But no, these aren't sponsors. I, these are, yeah, we're going to close those. Okay, anyway, <laughs> with that said, um, yeah, use Perel and use toilet paper, I guess, if you need to. Um, let's go ahead and dive into today's topic. So I'm going to actually not start in Photoshop. I'm going to start over in Lightroom. I have a variety of subjects to choose from, and this is what I'm what I'm doing today is what I consider the B-roll. If you're a photographer, what the B-roll means, because if you're in video and audio, you know the B-side of an album or used, what we used to have as albums, the B-side of a, a 45 back in those days, it would be the song that wasn't the main song. So these are images that weren't necessarily the main images, but they were still good. So what I mean by that is uh, you, do a sh you do a photo shoot, you capture 500 frames, you narrow it down, you eliminate all the ones that are just awful, like the ones, you know, flash it and fire, eyes were closed, they weren't looking, um, something was a distraction, they were in mid-movement, they were out of focus, all the things that we remove the photos for, those reasons, and maybe you narrow it down to 200. You get, you get rid of just you know, 300, 400, whatever it is. Um, but then you still go in and you pick, um, you know, you pick your favorites. Your subject picks their favorites. If it's a client, of course, they're going to pick their favorites. And um, you retouch those and you deliver those as the ones that you agreed to deliver for whatever your agreement was. But that doesn't mean you don't have images that you like, that you just didn't get a chance to retouch because they weren't the ones that you needed right then and there, and they weren't the ones that uh, your clients necessarily wanted to pay for, but you still like them, you still want to use them, they still have value. Uh, so those are the B-side images. Uh, so with that said, I have literally uh, 117 B-side images. We are definitely not going to get through all of these today. <laughs> I'm going to save some for this Friday because I'm also doing retouching on my um, photography show on Friday, day after tomorrow. So whatever I don't get through today, I will certainly work on Friday. And plus, I'll have some different ones um, that we haven't seen, hopefully, yet to work on Friday as well. So I can literally start on any of these. They uh, They're all... Um, candidates for a retouch and what I really want to do is spend a little bit of time of talking about um, what you would do in Lightroom versus what you would do inside of Photoshop or when would you go to Photoshop what's the difference because people always ask that question well I'm a photographer I've always used Lightroom Lightroom does everything I need why would I use Photoshop or vice versa I'm a, I'm a uh, person that's always used Photoshop whether I'm a photographer or not I don't even understand what Lightroom is. Why would I ever use Lightroom? So we're going to get past that question quickly, and then we'll dive in. So both programs, Photoshop, Lightroom, can edit images. They can both make an image look better. Photoshop, no limits, basically. Very few limits, if any. It's the program that can manipulate pixels in creative ways, and you can composite, you can add layers, you can remove parts of the image, you can um, cut an image out and put it on top of another image, you can do all kinds of things, you can work in 3D, you can add text, you can do all kinds of things that Lightroom doesn't do, never has done, and probably won't ever do, because that's not Lightroom's focus. Lightroom, on the other hand, yes, it can edit images, it can edit them all non-destructively, so therefore you're not really touching the pixels, but it also um, it also um, has those limitations that I just mentioned that Photoshop has. But what does Lightroom have that Photoshop doesn't? Organization. So if you're a photographer and you say, I want to bring in those 500 images and cull through them and eliminate the ones I don't want and so forth and so on, that's when you use Lightroom. So Lightroom is for your organization and editing. Photoshop is for your editing that can do way more than Lightroom ever could um, and probably ever will. So that's where the two programs have a little bit of overlap as far as the editing is concerned. Camera Raw and Photoshop, this is Lightroom, Lightroom's <laughs> developed module, Camera Raw and Photoshop are pretty much identical. They have the exact same sliders, exact same capabilities. Lightroom does organization, Photoshop does more editing than just that. All right, so with that, 
Um, Carol's asking a very good question. Why would I still use Adobe Bridge then? You didn't mention Bridge. What's Bridge and why would I ever still use that? Bridge was the predecessor to Lightroom for photographers and everyone else for that matter. So if you were a photographer before Lightroom existed over 10 years ago, then you would have been using Bridge to organize your images, to uh, do non-destructive edits with Camera Raw, so forth and so on. But here's the big difference between Bridge and Lightroom and why some people will still continue to want to use Bridge and most people that are photographers won't. Lightroom is a catalog system, meaning that if you open up Lightroom and you import images into it, which really means it's referencing those images wherever they are, then in that mat in that case, it's just it, it, Lightroom's keeping a catalog of what those images are, what they look like, what you've done to them so far, keywords, editing, so forth and so on. If you didn't have access to those images, let's say it was on a drive that was disconnected, Lightroom would still show you those images. Bridge, on the other hand, is a file browser. So it looks at a folder of images in real time. If that folder doesn't exist, meaning the drive is disconnected, Bridge can't see anything. It doesn't do anything. So from that standpoint, it's still a great tool for designers because it's better than the operating system for looking at content. And it looks at more than just images. It can look at different document types it can look at EPS and Illustrator files. It can look at InDesign documents. It can use PDFs. It can do a lot more from that standpoint, but it doesn't have anywhere near the breadth and depth of tools that a photographer would need. So, Bridge, great, for, great still for designers. Photographers, yeah, you can still use it, but you'd be better served in Lightroom. Lightroom, great for photographers, not so great for graphic designers because that's not what it's for. So that's really the distinction, and that's to answer your question, Carol, why, why you would use one or the other. Is there a better way to do a contact sheet? There are lots of ways to do contact sheets. All three programs can do contact sheets, so it depends on what you're looking for. Um, contact sheets can be done in Photoshop. Contact sheets can be done via bridge into Photoshop. Contact sheets can be, you can design a contact sheet in a print module of Lightroom. It just really depends on what you prefer. I prefer Lightroom's print module, and if we have time at the end, I'll show you why. Um, but that's really the differences between those two. Now, before I forget, because I will forget and I will just keep going on and teaching, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about today's schedule. So today on Adobe Live, we're going to be talking about um, the, we already did the Photography Daily Creative Challenge. Uh, Claudia did that uh, at nine o'clock. It's now past 9.30 uh, Pacific time. So you're with me with digital imaging. Up next after me is the Adobe XD Creative Challenge. And then um, Paul Tranny is going to wrap up the day at noon with um, editorial content. So still a full day of Adobe Live. Um, we hope that you guys continue to join us and continue to um, watch throughout the rest of the week. So let's go and let's do some retouching. All right. First and foremost, again, it doesn't really matter which one of these I start with, but since I do have an image at the very beginning here in my Lightroom, uh, Lightroom collection, I'm going to go ahead and start with that image. All right, so let's go ahead and look at that image. First of all, I can look at it in loop view. I can see that it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, the color's off a bit, meaning I can tell that background has a little beige or brown or something in it, and it shouldn't because that was a white background. <laughs> So it shouldn't have any color in it at all. If anything, it should just be gray or white or both. Um, and uh, I can zoom in on this image. I can see that it's in focus. Great. I see a few little imperfections here that we all have. And, you know, that's up to you and your subject, whether or not you want to remove those or not. But so far, pretty good image out of the camera. Now, when I go over to the develop module, this is where I would go in to fix a few of those things that I just mentioned. First and foremost, I start with a few things that may not be as noticeable, but definitely are going to be helpful for what you're going to do. So um, lens correction. This is something that I have learned that I want to use 99.99999% of the time. It's very rarely I don't want to do a lens correction. The only time I don't have to do a lens correction 
is if I shot it with a mirrorless camera because most mirrorless cameras do the lens correction inside the body of the camera. So there's no need for Lightroom to do it. All right, so if I turn that on, it, it'll, I don't know, I haven't turned it on this image. I don't know what it's gonna do, but you will probably be able to see a slight difference. See what it did around the edges. Look at the edges. The edges are kind of vignetted. And also her face just like kind of grew a little bit. And what it did in that case is it's correcting for the vignette, the, the dark edges around the lens that the lens did. And because a lens is curved, it's flattening out the image a little bit. So that's why your image will, will tend to go like that when you apply lens correction. Now, um, how does it know what to do? Well, it's looking at the metadata inside the image. So it's seeing what created this image. It said, oh, you shot this with a Nikon camera and you shot this with this particular lens, a 70 to 200 F2.8 lens. And I'm gonna therefore use the Adobe Nikon profile for that combination. So that's the difference uh, between just uh, not doing it and doing it. It just will make that subtle correction, and especially on people, and especially depending on the lens you use, you tend to want to make that correction too. All right, so once again, before, after. Now, the other question, I usually move on, but the other questions I usually get when I show this, I've moved on, people start asking questions, so let me get them out of the way now. Uh, the other question I tend to get is, what's removed chromatic aberration and how come you didn't check it? Because you only need that one if there is a visible problem. And that visible problem would exist around the edges. The edges of this image are the colors they're supposed to be. It's the color of her hair and the color of the background. If I saw like a green outline around the end image, that typically is caused by the camera shooting like into a direct sunlight or into a direct lighting situation that it literally just couldn't handle. It couldn't process properly. So it creates this chromatic aberration. Uh, and then you can just go ahead and check the box to remove it. So checking the box here doesn't do anything because it doesn't have that problem. So that's why I didn't check it. All right, the other question I normally get at this point, what if my camera wasn't automatically detected? And that could happen. Maybe you shot with some camera combination and lens combination that isn't a part of Lightroom. It isn't a part of Camera Raw. Then if it, if it didn't pick it by default, I'll give you an example. I have a, a drone. I have a, Mavic, um, I have a Mavic Pro and I also have a Mavic Air. And the Air doesn't have a profile. So when I would choose remove or, or enable profile correction with shots from the, from the drone, from the Air, it doesn't pick anything or it doesn't pick the right one. So you can manually go in and I could say, hey, I know this was a DJI um, drone. So I can start there. It won't have the right profile. If it's not there, it won't say Mavic Air when I choose it. Um, but then I can either pick the next closest thing because usually the drones, even though it doesn't have one specifically for the Air, usually they're pretty close. Um, and the, um, if I didn't pick the next closest thing, or maybe my camera is brand new, just invented, never listed here, then you can always go in and manually adjust for the distortion and vignetting. So if worst case scenario, none of this worked, you can just go in and use the sliders and remove the edges and straighten out the image. All right. Um, So um, someone's asking again about the chromatic aberration. Is it the red borders around green leaves, for example? It depends. It, it, I, I've never seen it red. I've usually seen it be green, but I, I imagine it could be red. If you're, in other words, you're seeing a halo around your subject that you didn't put there from the adjustment you made, it was shot that way, then I would turn that on just to see if it removes that fringe, whatever color that fringe is. Okay. Now that we've done that, we got the lens correction out of the way, I would head back to basic and um, I would choose a profile. Now a profile is a starting point for your correction. So I'm, I'm basically setting the groundwork. I'm laying the floor for this, this correction. And I'm saying, because this was shot in raw, I get my raw profiles and I have a choice between landscape, portrait, and vivid because standard and color means don't do anything. <laughs> 
Landscape, portrait, and vivid. Why would you need to choose one? Why, why do you, why would you care? Because typically if you're shooting in raw or you're working with a raw image, the raw image is coming out of the camera unprocessed. So unlike a JPEG, it doesn't look nice by default, meaning it, it, like there have been no adjustments in the camera to make the colors more vibrant. There's been no adjustments in the camera to sharpen it. There's been no adjustments in the camera to do any of those things with a raw image. Um, so that's why you pick a profile to kind of restore what you would have seen when you looked at the back of the camera briefly, that JPEG preview. All right, so for example, portrait would be a good choice and it made a very subtle change. I could see it on her cheek just a little bit. Um, I could also I also like to choose Vivid. So Vivid made the co overall color of this image much warmer. I may or may not want that. It depends. I think in this case, I do want Portrait instead. And the other beauty of the profiles, and it's not just for the initial starting point because there's a whole series of creative profiles as well. So you can do all kinds of things, black and whites, different color profiles. There's a ton of different profiles to choose from. And the beauty of any of the profiles, whether it's just the ones for Camera Raw or the creative ones when you choose Browse, is that no matter what pro when you choose the profile at the beginning, at the end, doesn't matter. It's never adjusting your sliders. So let's say you've gone in and tweaked the image and you got the image just right from a exposure, contrast, saturation standpoint. You got it looking great. And then you say, huh, I'd love to see it in, you know, black and white. I'd love to see it with a little bit more magenta to it. Then you could choose that profile and your sliders would never move. And you can always turn that back on or off. Okay, so that's why we choose a profile to start with. Next up is the white balance. Now I could choose, because this was shot in RAW, the white balance choices from the camera are still here. So I could say, hey, I know I shot this with a flash. Let's see what flash does. And that did make an improvement, but it's still not where I want it to be. So I'm going to go back to as shot. And last but not least, I'm going to say, no, 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 don't guess. Don't use a standard white balance. Let me pick a white balance from the image. Let me, let me tell you what should be neutral in the image. So when I click the white balance eyedropper, you head over to the image and you click it on something hopefully, if you have it in your image, something that should be around 18% gray. I don't have exactly 18% gray, but I do have that background. If I didn't have that, then the next closest thing I would pick is something that should be black or something that should be white. And when I, the reason I keep saying should be is because it's not, meaning that it's got a little color in it and that's not solid black. That's like black with beige on it. And so therefore it should be black. And if I click it, then it makes that adjustment. Now, again, I'm not crazy about it here, so I'm gonna try the background. The background was a better choice. So now I'm starting to see that grayish white color that the background should have been all along. All right, so now that we got our white balance set, and by the way, proper white balance doesn't mean it looks great. You can still go in and adjust your temperature um, to be what you think it should be. So for example, a lot of times with people and skin tones, we want the skin to look warmer. We don't look, want it to look too cold and like dead. We don't want, we want the person to look very much warm and alive. And to do that, um, if the white, proper white balance wasn't what you thought it should be, or even if the white balance, um, you, didn't, you didn't have anything to click on, you can still go in and just adjust this temperature slider a little bit more to the warm side to warm up your portrait just a little bit. So that's just a slight adjustment to give her skin a little bit more warmth to it. Okay, so again, I'm doing the things that I would do in Lightroom, whether I'm gonna to go to Photoshop or not, because these are all non-destructive. All right, next up, um, what's next? Well, the, when I took this shot, this is an old picture actually. When I took this years ago, I would now start going in and adjusting sliders because I would have, I don't have no choice. Um, today, however, we have the Adobe Sensei powered auto tone. So with auto tone, that's like saying Lightroom, take, take, a, take your best shot at it. Take, you know, you give it a, you, you give it an adjustment. If I like it, 
Yay, we win. If I don't like it, I can adjust the things I don't like about auto versus me having to start from scratch every single time. So for example, if I click auto, oh yeah, that made some nice adjustments. Her hair, her hair um, got a little bit more light to it. So again, before, look at her hair. Her hair got lightened a little bit. Um, the color still looks pretty good. It made all of these adjustments without me having to guess at each one. It lowered the exposure a little bit. It increased the contrast a little bit. It brought down the highlights. It increased the shadows. It did all of these things. And I can now say, okay, what don't I like? That's a lot easier than having to start from scratch. Well, I don't like the shadows being that light. So I'm going to bring the shadows back down just a bit. That was an adjustment that I thought it went too far on. So I just brought it back. Uh, next up, maybe the, oh, now I'm looking at it. Maybe I brought it back too much. That's about right. Okay. Uh, maybe the highlights. Eh, yeah, the highlights were okay the way they were. All right. It will never adjust. Well, I shouldn't say never. It doesn't currently adjust texture clarity and dehaze. So if you needed to adjust those, you would. Uh, if it were a male subject, I might add a little bit more texture because men, you know, we tend to like their features to look a little bit more rough. Female subjects, we like we tend to like our subjects to look a bit, little bit softer. So I probably wouldn't adjust those on a female subject. And then last but not least, you want to very much pay attention to vibrance and saturation because with vibrance and saturation, uh, it did a good job here. It only adjusted the vibrance. It did not adjust the saturation, but sometimes I've noticed it will adjust both. And that's okay if it's not a person. Um, when would you use, Tim's asking, when would I use texture versus clarity? So before we had, uh, and I'll, I'll go to a different image and show it to you, but before we had, we didn't have texture more than a year ago. Uh, before all we had was clarity. And the difference is, let me just bounce out of this one for a second. Let's go to a non, um, or you know what, let's go to a person, let's go to a guy. All right, let's look at this guy. All right. If I were to, first of all, let's hit auto and let's fix our white balance. There we go. See, look at the big difference in color there. Now, if I were to go in and say, and this is what I meant by it adjusted both the saturation and vibrance in this case, I'll get back to why you don't want to do that. Uh, but let's say I adjust the clarity and I, I'm going to zoom in um, a little bit more and it's just so we can see his eye. Now, when I adjust the clarity, the image looks sharper, but it's also adjusting the tone. If you look at the dark shadows around his eye here, when I adjust clarity, when I bring it back, that area gets lighter. When I bring it forward, those areas are getting darker. So not only is it sharpening, or no, I shouldn't say sharpening, not only is it making the, the details of the image stand out, but it's also adjusting the tonal values, which you may not want. Like I don't, maybe I don't want his skin to look darker. I just want the texture. That's why there's a texture slider. <laughs> All right, so if I go back to zero on that and I just increase the texture, it does not affect the, um, the tonal values. It just affects the texture. So the question that Tim asked is when would I use one or the other? It depends on what I want. If I want just the texture, which is most of the time now, then I would do the texture. If I thought that clarity was making an overall better image, maybe not on a person, maybe on a landscape, maybe on um, an architectural image, then I would use clarity instead. So that's why you now have a choice. In other words, people would say, oh, well, I'll just use texture from now on. That's great. I, it's not adjusting the tones. Maybe you wanted to. So that's why they didn't replace clarity with texture. They added it. So you could have your choice between the two or maybe even use both. Depends on what you want. Rarely are going to use both. The other way you would use texture, by the way, you notice when I pulled it to negative texture, his skin got softer. Well, you could use texture on a brush and soften skin with it, with the adjustment brush. So we wouldn't do it to him. We don't want him to look like a baby. But we, <laughs> we might want to soften uh, skin that looks a little too detailed. Let's just put it that way. Uh, so texture uh, has a, you can also use it in the negative way as well. All right, um, and because you can use it on the adjustment brush, I believe, if I go to my adjustment brush, 
and I go down to texture. Yep, texture has its own preset in the adjustment brush. So what I meant by that, and again, we'll just play with this image. Let's say I do want negative texture and I go in and I uh, start brushing. I'm softening this forehead only because that's where I'm brushing as opposed to uh, the rest of his skin. Like I don't want his eye to get soft. I don't want his other feature maybe to get soft, his other features, but I just want the forehead to get softer. So that's why having it on an adjustment brush is super cool. But yeah, we don't want to make him a baby. We don't want that to happen. So we're just going to undo all that. All right. Uh, so that's why you want uh, texture versus, cl versus clarity in those cases. Okay, let's go back to where we were. Let's get back. Oh, hang on. Wrong tool. Get out of the adjustment brush. Out of the adjustment brush. There we go. Go back. I zoomed in manually. There we go. And okay, so now what? Um, this is where you start making those decisions. This is where you start saying, am I done? Because you're going to constantly ask that question until you answer it. Yes. If you're done, you're done. There was nothing. If you're happy with where the image is, there's no reason to go any further. If you're not happy with where the image is, then it's time to continue to address the things you're not happy about. So retouching is always, A, like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Retouching is always in the eye of the person that is um, either A, doing the retouching or B, the client and what they want. So it's really up to you and A, your subject, or B, your subject, which one you want. Okay, um, so Steve's asking, is that a Wacom 1? I do have a Wacom 1, but this isn't it. This is the Wacom 16-inch. So the Wacom 1 is a 13-inch display, and I did have it here for a bit, but it was just too small for these eyes. Uh, so I needed something a little bigger. And by the way, I've downsized. This I used to have my... Uh, 27 inch Cintiq here. And it was just literally taking up too much space on my desk. I know that's a sad thing to have to downsize because it's too big, but uh, it, I just, I regain so much more space on my desk without the seven, without the 27. So the 27 has been moved to a different spot. And now I'm on uh, the Wacom uh, 16 inch. So speaking of that before, while you brought it up and before I forget, can you retouch with one of these? A mouse or a trackpad, or if you're still using trackballs, can you do that? Yes. Is it advisable? No. Because while it will work, all the tools in Photoshop work with a mouse. All the tools in Photoshop and Lightroom work with a trackpad. But the difference between a tablet of any kind, not it doesn't have to be a display tablet, it could be just a good old fashioned graphics tablet that you bought for 79 bucks. No matter what the tablet is, and no matter how cheap it is, even you know, a $50 tablet is going to be a million times better than a mouse. Because a mouse has a button, maybe multiple buttons, but it has a button on, off, down, up. That's it, there's no in between. There's no halfway down or two thirds down or a quarter down. It's either on or off. So when you're using a tool in Lightroom or Photoshop, it's all the way down, meaning 100% of whatever that tool is set to and all the way off when you let go. With a, with a stylus that's connected to a tablet, it's pressure sensitive. So it's based on how hard I press on the tablet that can control the amount of flow from whatever I'm adjusting, as well as the um, as well as the uh, size of the brush. So you can get a lot more done quicker and more accurately with a, any tablet. So yeah, I like Wacom, but I don't care what you use. Use a tablet. It could even be uh, in Catalina now, on, if you're on a Mac, it could even be your iPad with your Apple Pencil because now you can just use that display and retouch off that. So I don't care what you use, just a pressure sensitive stylus and pen of any brand is 10 times better than a mouse or trackpad. 
And again, it doesn't have to be a super expensive one. It could be whatever you can afford. It could be a used one. It does not matter. It will still be better than using a mouse today. Okay, so with that said, let's uh, continue on. And now let's talk about what, what else would I do? Well, I could say that I don't like the stray, the stray strands of hair. That could be one thing I don't like. Another thing I, I tend to want to do is I want, even though her, this is really in focus and her eyes are nice and sharp, maybe I want them even short. <coughs> oh no, I coughed. Sorry. Does that mean I, I, I ha, no, I, I coughed. Anyway, um, I want her eyes to look even sharper. So I might want to make adjustments that will do that as well. Uh, there are a few stray hairs here with the um, eyebrows. Maybe I want to remove those. There's a, a pimple here and there. Maybe I want to remove those. It, it, yeah, there's a pimple. So it, it's, all, it's all subject to taste. And this is what I mean by... <laughs> Data's like, oh no, the virus. This is what I mean by it's up to you and how far you go. Her skin looks great. Like there's nothing wrong with her skin. I, I wouldn't need to smooth it. But, you know, these little pimples, these little things that aren't permanent, maybe I remove them, maybe I don't. It's up to you and your subject. Maybe I don't like this strand of hair coming down. Maybe I don't like that strand of hair coming down. I definitely usually don't like strands of hair that cut across the eye. So all of this is little things that make your image look better. Um, and it's, it's all subject to you. So now the question becomes, which of those little things do I do here versus which of those little things do, is it time to head over to Photoshop? And uh, let's see what I would do here. So what I would maybe do here is I might do some sharpening here. In Lightroom, you have sharpening profiles. You have, um, let me zoom up, let me scroll up, there we go. You have an actual sharpening category. It's sharpen none, sharpen light, sharpen medium, sharpen heavy. And those are the new profiles, both in Lightroom Classic and Lightroom uh, Cloud version. I, those are okay, but they're ones I like better that were hidden from you. What do I mean by hidden from you? Well, you notice I have one called, I have two. I have two, one called Sharpen Faces and Sharpen Scenic. Well, if you're using Lightroom Classic and you didn't like notice, you probably don't even have those anymore. You used to, if you were using it back in the day, but those are gone. Yes, drink water, I agree. You found a cure. All right. Um, why don't I have those anymore? Because they were replaced with these, sharp and light, medium and heavy. But why do I prefer the other ones then? Well, if I go up to the presets here and I go to manage presets, this is where you get to turn on and off whichever presets you want. So I went and turned back on Classic General. That's where they are. Why did I turn those back on? Because I definitely wanted to get sharpened faces. Why do I like sharpened faces? Sharpened faces, as opposed to these other ones that are new, does a very cool thing. I'm gonna click on it. Now, you, you probably maybe not even notice the difference. Let's go back to none. And let's go to sharpen. And yeah, we can see it as I hover over them. Subtle change, but I'll go to sharpen faces. And it made a subtle change that may not may be very you know, insignificant to the human eye, but it made the change. Why do I like that one better? Because if I go to detail now, you'll notice that, and here I'll show you the difference. Let's, so let's actually see the sliders. So right now the sliders are on 35, 1.4, 15, and masking's on 60. If I go back to none, well, they go to none, as they would. If I go to light, they go to light. If I go to medium, they go to medium. If I go to heavy, they go to heavy. And really the only thing that kept moving was the amount slider. But notice masking never moved. But if I go to my favorite one, Sharpen Faces, masking moved. Why did masking move on the old one, but not the new ones? Because of this one word, Sharpen Faces. In other words, Lightroom has had for many, many years the ability to detect a face. It knows what a face is. And when we're sharpening faces, we tend to want to sharpen 
attributes of the face, but not the skin. We tend to want to sharpen very specific things. We want to sharpen the eyebrows. We want to sharpen maybe the lips. We want to sharpen the jewelry that she's wearing. We want to sharpen the hair, but we don't want to sharpen the skin. That would just look weird. So why does masking get turned on with this one? So I'm going to hold down my option key and you're going to get a very scary looking image when I do this. I'm going to hold down my option key and I'm going to click. Look at what happened. I'm holding down both. I'm holding down my option or alt key on Windows and I'm holding down the masking slider. And everything in black did not get sharpened. Everything in white did get sharpened. So it knew what the face was and it knew what areas should get sharpened and which ones shouldn't. And you can adjust the mask. You'd say, no, sharpen more of it. It's a guy. I want more things sharpened. Or no, it's a female subject or a baby. I only want attribute sharpened. Don't sharpen these areas that are in black. So a very hidden gem. And this is why I went immediately and turned back on Sharpen Faces. And in the new Lightroom Cloud version, I just copied these settings and made my own Sharpen Faces over there so that it's on my phone as well. And that way I have the best sharpening possible for, um, for sharpening people, for sharpening faces. So that's why I like that. And that is something I would definitely do here in Lightroom as opposed to getting over to Photoshop to do my sharpening. People always say, should you do sharpening in the beginning? Should you do sharpening at the end? And the answer is yes, it's up to you. <laughs> I do it in the beginning so I don't forget. There's no reason, no rhyme or reason you have to do it one way or the other. People like to do it at the end because as a finishing step. People like to do it in the beginning like me so they don't forget. Uh, I don't really care where when you do it, just do it because sharpening makes the image look better. All right, next, back to basic. Let's talk about removing those, those things I talked about. So could I remove this pimple in Lightroom? Yes. Should I remove this pimple in Lightroom? Maybe. Why wouldn't I remove this pimple in Lightroom? Because it's harder. <laughs> so um, if, it was, if this was the only thing I needed to remove, yeah, I'd probably do it here and be done. But if I got like several I want to remove, like, oh, now I'm noticing the lipstick kind of spilled out onto her face. Well, I would want to fix that. And I'm just noticing little things around the image that I would want to take care of. Well, now I'm starting to basically exceed my patience with what Lightroom does. And this is what I mean. When you go to your spot removal tool in Lightroom, and let's make our brush a little smaller. By the way, another reason we like uh, to use a tablet is this has express key. This has the express key remote. So watch as I dial this down, I can make my brush bigger or smaller. So you definitely want a tablet that has um, either a separate. You can buy this for any Wacom tablet, or the um, express keys are built onto the tablet. So my 27 inch had this. My 24 inch, they're all on the sides of the screen. Uh, and this just makes life easier because this can sit anywhere and I can just use my other hand to control brush size while I use my right hand uh, to make the adjustment. Okay, so now that I made my brush size no bigger than it needs to be, the next thing we want to do is uh, click. And when you click, it's literally throwing the dice. It's like Lightroom will guess where it should pick up from. This time it guessed good. Sometimes it guesses bad. So if it guesses bad, you can either A, pick it up and move it to a better spot. And by the way, um, you have a choice over here. I left it on clone for my last class, but you want to usually leave it on heel for this type of work. You can pick it up, move it where you want, and it will pick up where you, where you do it. So for example, if I go here and click, boom, that worked. Okay, click, boom, that worked. Oh, see, now it's getting that neckline. Well, it shouldn't be pulling that neckline down in here, so I'm going to just move it. So this is what I mean by it, it, it depends. Now, let's say I wanted to try and take out this, this extra line of makeup here that we don't need. Well, I'd make my brush smaller, and I would just literally drag it instead of clicking, and then it's going to randomly pick up spot, and I don't want it right there, so I'm just going to move it up there. And the same thing on this one, just again, just a random line of makeup that shouldn't be there, and let's move that. So this is what I mean by, yeah... 
You could do that. Should you? If you only have a couple, yeah, well, you can. Why not? But if I want to get rid of all the little strands of hair, if I want to get rid of, I want to soften this neckline, I want to get rid of lines under the eyes, I want to do a whole bunch of stuff, then it's just going to be faster and easier in Photoshop. But if you do it here, it's non-destructive. You can always go back and move those. You can always go back and delete those points. You can always go back and change them. You can always go back and do whatever you want to those points in Lightroom. Once you do it in Photoshop, it's going to be kind of permanent to that layer at least. Okay. Um, what if it picked a different spot and you want to change it? I'm hitting a key and it's randomly moving around. See it jumping around? And the key I'm hitting for it to randomly pick a different spot is the forward slash key, the one next to, on a US keyboard next to the period. Uh, so the forward slash key is a tip in Lightroom that says, you guessed wrong, guess again. I don't wanna pick up the mouse and move it. Guess again, you should do it. All right. Should you ask the model client before you remove any blemishes? It depends on the relationship. It's going to sound weird, but it, it does depend on the relationship. I would definitely ask if it was something permanent. Like, for example, a mole. Maybe you don't like the mole, but maybe it's their favorite facial feature. So, yeah, definitely ask before you remove something permanent. If it's something temporary, meaning it won't be there in two weeks, I tend to just go ahead and remove it. If it's something that I'm unsure of, then, yeah, I'm going to ask. It also depends on who's the client. Is the image for me? Then I'm going to remove it. <laughs> if the image is for them, then I'm going to ask. It depends on also like who's the client. Am I the client or are they the client? In other words, did I hire a model for a shot for my portfolio? If that's the case, then it's up to me the way I want the image to look. Did a client come in and pay me to do a photo shoot for their wedding engagement? then it's up to them because it's their portrait and the way they want it to look. I don't really care one way or the other. So yeah, you should ask. It depends. Um, yeah, you definitely need to ask if it's something that is permanent on them, a beauty mark, a tattoo, a mole, a something that, that's part of their identity. You should definitely ask and get an okay. A lot of times too, and I'll show you this in Photoshop, rather than remove something, just you can de-emphasize it. So in other words, the mole's still there. We just, it's not as pronounced or not as strong. In other words, it doesn't become a distraction. And also when we look at this, this stuff in, um, um, in portrait retouching to begin with, you gotta remember a lot of things we're seeing right now, like those little, line, two little lines of makeup, I would have never ever noticed in person because they're just not big enough and you're not standing there staring at someone and saying, I'm touching my face. You're not staring at someone saying, Huh. Don't move. So let me stare at you for a minute. Let me make sure I see anything that I don't like. Yeah, like you're not doing that. So in person, you um you don't notice these things. So what's unfair about digital imaging, especially now with the camera shooting 50 megapixels on up, is that we're locking a person in time in HD. Like we're locking a person in high definition where we get to study every little unflattering characteristic that they that would you would never notice in person. So that's why it depends on what it is. Um, red eye effect. I don't usually get red eye effect because I light properly. But, but yeah, you would remove the red eye effect if it was in the photo. And there is a red eye. Uh, there's even a red eye brush that I've never used here in Lightroom. There it is right there. So you can use that to remove red eye. Uh, I think also um, in this latest update to Lightroom, one of the Lightrooms even detects pet eye. So you can fix pets that way as well. All right. So the other thing that will start to get to me is like little things like this, hair coming off the ears, hair running across the ears. And those will be, again, the kind of things that would be, um, would be distracting to me. So again, that, that's where I would start to say, okay, it's, it's time to move over to, to um, Photoshop to do more. All right, so let, let's go back into the adjustment brush because I do want to, I want to, um, actually, let me go to my history here. I do want to not bring over um, those spot removals that I did. So I'm gonna just go back in history 
until I go be before I did the last spot removal. So now all the spots are back. So if I zoom in now, oh, hang on. oh undo, sorry. Uh, if I zoom in now and I on the right tool, not on that tool there. Oh, not on that tool either. There we go. If I zoom in, I'm on the right tool. Then yeah, all that stuff came back because I went back in time and took it out. So you have a history of everything you've ever done in Lightroom to this image. Like literally everything you've ever done in Lightroom to this image will be saved in history. That's also another good thing about Lightroom's non-destructive nature. Okay, so now let's say, you know what? I'm not gonna spend time here clicking and having it reevaluate and where it should be and all that. I do wanna take this over to Photoshop. So you can get there a few ways. There's a keyboard shortcut, Command E. You can also just right click and say edit in. Um, and that will, uh, and by the way, here's the other thing too. Because this is a raw image, it will automatically make a copy because you can't edit the actual raw file. If it were a JPEG, it would ask me if I want to make a copy. So when I get over to Photoshop, people are like, oh my God, you're working on the background. Aren't you afraid you won't be able to get back if you make a mistake? I always have the original to get back to. So no, I'm not afraid. Um, but here, if you are afraid, absolutely make copies of your layers. So I'm going to say edit in Photoshop. It will take that copy over to Photoshop. It may already be open in Photoshop. Let's see. Yep, there it is. It'll take that copy over to Photoshop and now I can do anything I want. So for the sake of your sanity, I will duplicate the layer just for you. I don't normally do that because I already have the copy back in Lightroom, but just so you feel better. All right, next up, let's go ahead and now take a look at some of these things that I mentioned before. So would I, um, let's say that was a mole. Let's say that's supposed to be there, meaning that's part of her identity and it's not temporary and it's something that she wants to keep. Well, I mentioned a way to, um, to lessen it. In other words, just make it not so pronounced. It's still there, we just don't want it to be pronounced. Well, there's a way to do that. We can take our patch tool, and I'm just gonna go ahead and draw around it. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and remove it. Now, when I let go, it will be gone completely. We don't want it to be gone completely if it's something that should be there but maybe we just don't want it to be so pronounced and we definitely do this under the eyes. So under Photoshop's edit menu, while it's still selected, if you deselect, this is all gone. So you have to do your patch and then immediately go to this feature. Go to fade patch selection. Fade will be gone if you deselect. So fade patch selection brings up this slider, which is undo on a slider. Go all the way back to the original, go halfway, yeah, it's still there, but not as pronounced. You can adjust to your taste. You can have it be completely gone, have it be 65% gone, you can have it be 40% you know, still there, whatever it is, whatever the math works out to be. You can adjust accordingly so that something that should be there, but you don't want to stand out, you can do that. All right, so now let's click OK, and that would be, now you can deselect, and now you've made that one change, and here's your before, and here's your after. So you just lessened it from people that would normally not be staring at her face anyway, like locked in time. All right, so next up, uh, same thing here. I could use the patch tool, but I also uh, I also love my spot healing brush. So spot healing brush, one will dial down with my left hand, the brush size, we'll go to the hands cam so you can see it. And I can go in and I can just simply say, you know, let's take that off, take that off, cool. All right, now I mentioned eyes. Eyes are very important to me. Her eyes really don't have a lot under them. And when people, um, when I said earlier that people can over retouch, over retouching would be this. This would be an example of over retouching. Patch tool. To where she looks like she's, you know, was just born. Like nothing under the eye. Completely just born, completely smooth. So, and you would even smooth that out. You can get rid of those blemishes. That's overdoing it. it. People have lines under their eyes because, hey, they do have lines under their eyes. We all do. But also, it depends on the lighting. I can look in her eyes and I can see three little white lights, which means I used a triflector to bounce light back up to her face. So, therefore, 
her shadows under her eyes are already gone. I don't need to do this. There's nothing I didn't like properly that I would need to go fix now. So I wouldn't really do anything under her eyes. But if I did, she doesn't need it. But if I did, I would do the same thing. I would fade it to where I'm not completely removing it. I'm just removing some of it. So you adjust by how much of it you want to remove. And then when I deselect, again, I have that before after to just kind of smooth it out a bit but don't get rid of it completely because it just looks fake it just looks like something shouldn't have, shouldn't have been there or you did something wrong all right next up now again these little hairs here i might go in and just remove some of them and that would again that's between you and your client because some people could be easily offended that hey what are you trying to say you're trying to say i need to go visit my esthetician um, again, that's between you and your client. So again, just little subtle things to make the image look better. Now, again, up here, what's bothering me the most, it's okay if there's hair on her forehead, but not just one stray hair. Like that bothers me. So I would just definitely, let's make the brush bigger. I would definitely take care of that. And again, these little things. I'm not having to go in Lightroom and tell it, no, 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 not that spot, this spot. That's why it's just so much faster to do this in Photoshop. Just little subtle things that we normally wouldn't know and no one's really even going to see because they're not going to zoom in on your image like this. But every little bit makes a difference. All right. Okay, next up. Uh, eyes. Um, I, could, I mentioned this earlier. They're in focus. They look great. I still like them even sharper, no matter what. I sharpened the image already. It already sharpened the eyes. I want the eyes themselves even sharper. So in Photoshop, there is a sharpen tool. The sharpen tool, oh, where did I put my sharpen tool? So what happens when you customize your tool panel, remembering where something is. Okay, there's my sharpen tool. And the sharpen tool um, has come a long way over the years. It now includes a feature called protect detail. And with Protect Detail, that's telling it not to screw the image up. What I mean by that is before Protect Detail, if you were to sharpen an image, you might get one pass, maybe two. But then it would start to destroy the image. So this is what I mean. This is bad sharpening. Like it's starting to pixelate the image. Her Like that little soft white catch light is now pixelated. That's not good. And that's why people never used the sharpen tool back in the day because... It would destroy their image. So undo that, leave it on protect detail, and now you have a, a much better sharpening experience. Just make the image sharper without destroying these uh, areas. And it's sharpening on a brush. Um, so you get to pick and choose where it does it. So where else would I sharpen? Absolutely anything that should have a lot of detail to it. Like, ooh, this crazy, like scary necklace that I just noticed. Like I would sharpen all that up. And again, sharpen already did some of it before we left. She doesn't have any earrings on, but I would sharpen earrings too. Um, Lightroom already did a lot of this, so I don't have to do anything. I don't really have to do more, but I, I like the eyes to really pop and be sharp. All right, now speaking of the earrings, she's not wearing them. So if she's wearing earrings, great. She's not wearing earrings, I don't want to see the empty holes. So... She didn't wear them, so the holes go. That's just a personal pet peeve of mine. Again, totally up to you. None of this should be looked at as law. You are deciding what you want to do based on your subject and your image. Now, let's talk about this flyaway hair. I'm not going to do all of it because it's just going to take more time than we have today. But um, there's lots of ways to remove flyaway hair. You could clone it out. You can patch it out. You can... Uh, use blending modes to try and remove it. You can there's just clone it out. There's all kinds of ways to remove it. Um, you can brush it out. If you change your brush to a... Um, here, let me show you a brush, tip, brush, a brush trick. If I change my brush to lighten mode. Uh, there we go. Lighten mode. So what that's telling Photoshop to do is make anything lighter than... The foreground color and i haven't sampled the foreground color yet so let's sample it option or alt click now i've sampled the foreground color make a nice big brush 
and now I can just brush the hair away because the hair is darker than the background. So it makes a nice subtle change using a blending mode right on the brush to make the hair go away. So that's another way to do it. So lots of ways to do that, but I would just go ahead and uh, get rid of any stray hairs. Maybe you don't get rid of all of it, but you get rid of the ones that are really sticking out all by themselves. Um, we can go on the other side, do the same kind of thing. Option, click this side because it's going to be a different shade. And then just come in and say, no, no, no. Using my blending mode, just lighten those hairs up so they pretty much disappear. I don't like them hanging up like, like this one. Just all off by itself there. We don't want that. So you do your you do your thing there. But anyway, that would be what one of the things I would do. So up here, this is one of the ones that bugged me because it's just literally a, a stray hair all by itself. So maybe I go to my um, spot healing brush. And just kind of remove all of the strayness, these single hairs that do look like a mistake. They don't look like they're supposed to be there. And by the way, this is when you're shooting. If you're taking these portraits and you're like, hey, I noticed you have some stray hair, they would be happy to fix that with a brush or a comb so that you don't have to do it in post. But a lot of times we just don't see it when we're shooting or we're so anxious and we're like so in the moment, we're not paying attention. And this will be an example of, dang, I wish I had paid attention because she could have just brushed this away and patted it down. Or maybe there's a hair, hairstylist on set and they would just fix it instantly and I wouldn't be having to do this. So always better to fix it in the camera and not say, oh, I can get rid of that in Photoshop. All you're doing is setting yourself up for more work. If you can get rid of it in the camera, why wait till you get to Photoshop to do it? All right, same kind of thing here. Just getting rid of a lot of these obvious stray ones with the spot healing brush. And again, I'd probably, now another uh, example would be using your clone stamp tool. So I just hit the letter S and we're gonna go ahead and hold down my option or alt key. And also the clone stamp tool does have a blending mode as well. So you can use the same trick of setting it to lighten or darken to get rid of the stray hairs that way as well. All right, cool. Okay, next up, and this is kind of one of my, you know, I could go on and on and on, but this is kind of one, one of my finishing touches that I do, and it's basically a little dodge and burn trick. So with dodge and burn, um, what I want to do is I want to... Um, add contours. I want to add more like depth to the image. So to do that, I will, um, I will I, I'll run my action, but <laughs> I have an action set up for it. But my action for dodge and burn, there it is. All it's doing is going to duplicate the layer. It just did it. it made a copy of the layer. It set the blend mode to that layer to luminosity and switched me automatically over to the burn burn tool. That's just, the action is literally just doing three things. But since I do it every single portrait, I don't want to have to do those three things every single time um, myself. So it's just that's why I set up actions for a lot of the things I do so I don't have to do them manually every single time. Okay, so what am I doing now? So now I have dodge and I have burn. I start off with burning, then I go to dodge. What does burn do? What I want to do with burn is I want to go around the edges of the face where it's blending the dark hair to the light skin. So I'm just going to darken it, those areas a little bit more. Now, it looks like I'm hardly doing anything, and that's the whole point. It shouldn't be drastic. You should never be like, oh, it's night and day, because it shouldn't be drastic. It shouldn't be something that's so so distinct that you can like oh my god it's so so big of a difference it should be little subtle changes all right now next i will go to dodge and then i'm going to go to the areas that are already light and just make them a little lighter maybe i want the eyes to be a little lighter as well so i can go ahead and dodge them great and these little highlights i'm, I'm very, using very little pressure here so it's just doing a little bit here 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 areas that are already light 
just lightening those areas up. And you're probably saying, well, Terry, I really don't even see any difference. Well, you will when I show you the before and after. So that's after, before. <laughs> it looks like almost a totally different person. Just with a little dodge and burn. I'm not showing the whole before and after. I'm just showing the dodge and burn before and after. So dodge and burn, before and after. Another trick for while you're dodging and burning is while you're on dodge, you can also lighten streaks and areas of the hair. So if you want parts of the hair to be lighter or darker, it's a great tip or trick for that as well. So now again, before, after, just adds that little bit of depth, that little bit of, um, of contour. Oh, someone's saying, hey, I can't see the layers panel. There's a layers panel. Um, so before, after, before, after, and all that did was add that extra layer that's set to luminosity um, and that's it. So it's it's duplicate the layer, set the layer to luminosity, switch to your Dodge Burn tool. And then you you paint basically on that layer that's set to luminosity. All right, so people do it with a 50% gray layer. There's all kinds of ways to do Dodge and Burn, but that way is the way I do it. All right, so um, do I need to keep that layer? I don't, you might, it's up to you. Uh, I tend to not keep it if I'm happy with the way it looks. I can always go back and redo it or add more by just running the action again or duplicating the layer again. So I'm just gonna go ahead and merge that down with the command E. So this is our overall before and after. So this is the, the layer I started with at the very beginning and now where we are right now with the hair removed, the sharpening, the dodge and burn, all the little things I've done so far. And there's some hair on the neck I would get rid of and there's lots of little things I would keep doing but we're gonna go ahead and move on. All right, so let's save this. When we when it's finished saving, um, and we close it, and we head back over to Lightroom, it will put it right next to the original in the same collection. So that way, I still have the original raw file untouched. That's why I didn't really need to make an extra layer, um, and I have the um, the new PSD or TIFF file depending on your preferences in Lightroom. Uh, could you do dodge and burn in Lightroom? Yeah, you could do some adjustment with exposure, adjustment brush and exposure. It's not quite the same, but there's no dodge and burn tool. Um, but you could use the adjustment brush and kind of fake it. So, yeah, you can. I just don't, <laughs> but you can. All right, uh, next up. Let's see. We are good on time. Let's let's get to something different. Here. I want I want to get to some quicker examples of things. Uh, that and, and by the way, before I even forget, let's let's go do this now. Um, cause I don't want to, I don't want to run out of time and not do this. Let's do a quick, this is the, the, the time when we're ready to cut an image out. So you need to cut an image out and, and put it on a different background. So we're going to do that example once and for all. And I'm going to show you some techniques that may not be as obvious when you're using these tools, but they will make all the sense in the world going forward. All right. So let's say, for example, uh, this is my background. All right. And I want to put, uh, I don't know, I, like I found, I just went to Adobe Stock and I said, show me flowing hair. Like just show me a couple of images with lots of hair that would be difficult to cut out. So I could do, I'll do actually one of each. I have this subject to do. Not so much flowing, but definitely hair and inter, interspersed in the background. And um, I'll turn that one off for now. And I have this one to do. And that was that was the one that's kind of crazy. Okay, so we want to do both of these. And again, I'll put that one there. All right, so I have that one and I have that one on top of my new background. Okay, so how would we do this? And the way the way you might think to do it is probably gonna frustrate you because there's a little trick to it that isn't obvious. Photoshop has Select and Mask, and that's what we're ultimately going to use. There are all kinds of ways to do this. You can do it with channels. You can do it with um, adjustment layers, blend modes. There's all kinds of ways to do it. But Select and Mask is really the preferred way because it's designed specifically for this. All selections you make in Photoshop are tend to be hard edge selections, and that's what Select and Mask does. It tries to figure out what should be hard, what should be soft. Hair should be soft. Her shoulders should be hard. Those are hard edges versus soft edges. So we have an image that has both. 
Well, how do we do this? We need to get a selection at some point. Now, you can either A, make the selection first, or B, you can just go right to Select and Mask and make your selection, which I have it on 100. Make your selection right here in Select and Mask with the Quick Select tool. So you can do it either way. I'm going to cancel out of it because I don't do it that way. The way I do it is I go up to my Select menu and I choose Select Subject. And this is where I'm going to say that this is where, where, you're, where you're blowing it. <laughs> this, is, this is the part of the process where people don't do the right thing. Or they, they don't do it as effectively. I'll put it that way. It's not a right or wrong. It's, it's which way will work better. Uh, so when I say Select Subject, that will make a hard edge selection. It tried to do the best it could around the hair. It missed a lot of hair. It missed the insides. It missed this big inside because it was all connected. So it didn't know to go inside. And um, I could try and someone says select the color. I could select the color. But the color range is also kind of difficult in this case because, well, not difficult, but it would be more difficult than what I'm about to show you. Because uh, it, it is blue, but it's going from a light blue to a dark blue. So you'd have to make sure you get the range right. And if the person has any blue in them, then that becomes even more difficult. Meaning if they're wearing a blue shirt or they're wearing you know, a blue hat or whatever. But in this case, we're going to do select subject. And if you go to selected mask immediately after doing your select subject, that's where you're, you're setting yourself up for not the best results. There's something you need to do first. Selected mask on hair works best when there's when it can see a transition. Right now, the selection goes all the way to the edge of the hair in most cases. It's all the way to the edge. So there's no transition here. There's transition here where it didn't go to the edge. There's transition here where it didn't go to the edge. No transition here. So there are places where it did give me a transition and absolutely places where it didn't. You want a transition. You want that space between solid hair and hair mixed in background the hair mixed in background is the transition area. You don't want that selected. Simple as that. You don't want that area selected yet. And here's why. You hear a dog. You hear Lisa because she saw something or heard something. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and we're going to grab our lasso. And I don't see my lasso. It's here somewhere. I'll just hit the letter L. There's my lasso. I grab my lasso. And with my lasso, I'm going to hold down my Option or Alt key to deselect. In other words, there are parts of this I want to deselect. I want to, I want to create my transition area. So I'm going to hold down my Option key, and I'm just going to draw a big selection around what I want to be my transition area. So I want all of this to be deselected, but then I'm going to come inside and say that should all be deselected. It's okay if you do that. That should all be deselected. I'm telling it what parts to keep. There we go. And you'll see what I mean when I'm done. There. I deselected the parts of the hair that are transition area. Now, in some cases, there's a transition area inside, like here. So I'm going to hold down my Option key once again and say, no, no, no. That's all transition. There's blue in there. So what I'm trying to say is I don't want any of the blue in my initial selection or as little as possible of it. Same thing here. There's a little bit of blue there. And I want the edges that should be sharp to remain selected. So shoulders, I didn't do anything to. The bottom, I didn't do anything to. Anything that should be a hard edge, let it go all the way to the edge. That's fine. Now that I've done that, and here I can go in here, and I can hold down the shift key, and I can even add some of this back in. There we go. But yeah, the rest of that I want to be transitioned. I'm just making sure I got everything the way I want it. Shift key, I'm going to add a little bit more of this back in. There we go. Add a little bit more of this back in. So shift key adds, option or alt key subtracts. Now that I've done that, now we can go to select and mask. When I go to select and mask, it's going to look crazy <laughs> because it's to let you know that's what you would get if you let if you stop here. Like that would be the crazy cutout that looks like you did it with a pair of scissors. We don't want that, <laughs> obviously. 
Now, you have different modes you can look at this in. I can look at the marching ants, which is totally useless. I can, in this case, I can look at the overlay, which is kind of useful. And the overlay has an opacity as well. So you can kind of see what you missed in red. You can look at this in uh, on black. And again, not really useful in this case, but you can see what you missed and see areas of blue. Not really the best choice here. You can look at it on white. You can also very easily with the opacity, see what you missed. You can even look at the mask itself, which again, doesn't help me in this case. And I'm gonna look at it on the layers. I'm gonna look at the onion skin, which is the newest option, but I'm just gonna dial down the opacity so I can see the hair I missed. All right, so I can still see the blue, the whole blue background, just transparent. And I can really see the areas of hair that I missed. And you can dial it down to whatever you need to be able to see what you're missing. Now, it automatically put you on the right tool. It automatically put you on the Refine Edge brush. And that's where you want to be. Because with the Refine Edge brush, we're going to go ahead and we're going to make a... You want to make the brush... You don't want to do this trying all in one big fatal swoop. You don't want a giant brush. Smaller is better. Um, this is a decent size. I might even go a little smaller. You want a small brush because it just works better. Now I'm going to go in. Oh, one more thing. When you start brushing around the hair, start on the blue. Don't start on the hair because what you're telling Photoshop is the teal. Start with the teal. What you're telling Photoshop to do is this is the color you should be taking out. If you start on the hair, it's going to say, oh, I should be taking out brown. So start on the teal. All right. And uh, now I can go in and I can brush back in all the stuff that should be there. And like magic, it's like magic. It will recalculate. You might have to do a couple passes at it, but it will figure out based on you starting with the blue and then brushing back in the color you want it to remove, it will figure out what that color is and where it should take it off on the hair. Now, if you're shooting your subject, like if you're photographing the subject and your intent is, hey, I'm photographing this because I know I want to cut this out one day, then photograph the subject on light gray. Light gray is the easiest color to cut out and there's a reason for that. Because any other color, teal, orange, green, blue, red, any other background color is likely going to be reflected into the subject. And if you don't want that blue to be on the actual hair itself, then use gray because gray doesn't have, it's the least reflective of the colors that will reflect and be still on your subject. Okay. Now, when I let go, it spins a minute because it's, it's calculating to say, oh, did I do a good job or not? And you can always see if you did a good job by adjusting the transparency, transparency accordingly. Now, I still see teal because that's the color being reflected onto the hair. So I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep adjusting this to make sure I just bring back as much of the hair as possible. I'm not worried about the teal color on the hair just yet, I will fix that in a minute. I'm just making sure I don't forget anything and leave any gaps of hair that should be brought back or any holes that I deselected earlier. So I just wanna make sure I brush over everything that I wanna bring back and then we'll deal with the, the color. Okay, so now we brought all the, the nice fine strands of hair back, but we don't, want the, we don't want them to be teal even though she was on a teal background. So that's what my next favorite option is. Decontaminate colors. Take the teal out of the subject. Take whatever the background that you just brushed, you just removed, you just extracted from, take that color out of the subject. Watch. Ready? One, two, three, click. It's like magic. I told you it would be. <laughs> and now... Um, now we got our two. So you said spot on her shoulder. What kind of spot? Which shoulder also? I don't see a spot on the shoulder. Do you? No, I'm not seeing a spot on the shoulder. Unless I'm missing something. But anyway, 
Let's zoom out. And let's see, let's, now let's look at the mask. Now you have a beautiful hair mask. It's not just black, it's just not white. It's all the transitions and all the fine hairs going through it. Spot on the shoulder should go, I'm not, again, I'm not sure what you're talking about, but okay. Um, that's the way to cut out hair. If you go to the edge with your initial selection, it will not work this way. It will not work nearly as good. It will start cutting things out that it shouldn't be cutting out because there's no transition. All right. Um, oh, you see through the shoulder on the right. Maybe. Let's see. Did I? All right. Now, if there's an edge, like let's say that like this part where you're starting to see transparency on that area, then you can either do one of two things. You can either try the refined edge brush or you can literally just use the brush tool itself to brush that back in. So by brushing this back in, you're telling it to, let's see if I go too far, I'll we'll start adding blue. You're telling it to fill in. Oh, I see what you mean here, right here. You're telling it to fill in any area you might have overdone it on. And I overdid the brush right there. So let's zoom back out. There we go. Wow, you got a good eye, dude. You saw that. That was a dude, right? Yeah, Mark. <laughs> you saw that. Um, zoomed out, I think. So, good eye. All right. Okay. So, fix any transparency issues you would have. Um, no, have too much. Oh, no, no. There we go. All right. So, I got my decontaminate in. Now, what's next? There, you can adjust other things you want. If you need to, to um, shift the edges to the left a little, you can. If you want to turn on smart radius, you can. Uh, but this looks pretty darn good the way it is. Uh, next and last but not least, we want to turn on the um, option to output it. So normally, it would output it as a selection. We don't ever want just a selection. I don't ever want just a selection. I want a new layer. I want this duplicated with um, a mask. So if I miss something, I could always go back. So duplicate layer with a mask and click OK. And that will give you exactly what it just said. You have your original layer that you cut out, that you started with. Now you have your new layer with the beautiful mask on it of your subject. All right, we're going to uh, take this up. We're going to take this to the next level, even though it looks great. No cutout will render every piece of hair. Nothing does that yet. It just looks good, but it doesn't look perfect. And there's no selection that will be perfect on strands of hair. But what if it's missing hair that I don't even notice it's missing? Well, there's a, there's a weird trick that just works. Trust me, it just works. You'll try it and you're like, damn, that works. Um, and that is just take the layer you just cut out and don't do anything to it. Just take that layer and duplicate it. I'm just going to duplicate that layer that I just cut out, not do anything to it. Look how much it filled in. <laughs> that was so, it's so weird that that works. So before the duplication, and maybe you're happy with that. Maybe that's all you want after the duplication. It's like she you know, got a whole new shampoo treatment that just made her hair fuller. And it's just, I don't know why that works because pixels are pixels. It's just putting the pixels on top of each other. I don't know why, but duplicate the layer and that would be great. Okay, next up. Well, she's lit in the studio and this is like sunset or sunrise in a city. The light doesn't match. So if you're going to do this kind of composite, it's not a matter of just cutting it out. It's also, uh, so Tim's asking, could you also increase the contrast of the layer mask and with select subject, with the select and mask? Layer mask. Not in select subject, but you could, or not in select and mask, but you could do it after the fact. Sure. Um, oh, let me, um, let me undo a couple things. I, I moved her and I shouldn't have moved her yet. So now let's duplicate the layer. Okay. Next up, we're going to go ahead and, um, um make the color match better and what i mean by that is she's like not the right tone for this background and that's typically what you're going to get with two different backgrounds you're going to get 
uh, subject you photographed in studio or outside and the subject that the background you're putting on was shot with different light. And that's, uh, that's just not looking right. It looks like you did it on purpose. So, um, or it looks like an accident. So what we're going to do is we're going to select the mask. We're going to, we're going to hold down our command key on Mac PC control key and click that just basically made a selection just like the mask did. Now with that selection in place, we're not going to touch the selection. We're just going to go down to the background where we originally put behind her, select it. And then we're going to do a new layer via copy, meaning copy the selection onto a new layer, may basically take this piece of the background and put it on a layer by itself. So that's PC Command J or PC Control J, Mac Command J. All right, and if we were to turn off everything, that's what we just did. Turn everything back on, and we're now we're gonna take that copy that we just made and we're gonna move it all the way up to the very top. So, oh, I didn't get it up there, hang on all the way up to the very top of the layers. There we go. So it looks a little crazy with the hair, but that's basically the scene behind her on its own layer with the selection of the mask. Now we're gonna run a filter on just that layer one. That, that cut, we're gonna call that the color layer. We're gonna run a, uh, I don't know if I spelled color right. I probably used this capital. Okay, anyway, we're gonna run a filter on it. Go to our filter menu. Blur average. What we're trying to get is the average color of the background. So it's going to be a solid color, but it's going to take the blue, the beige, the yellow, the green over there on the right. It's going to take all these colors and average them together. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not going to take the green on the right because we don't have that selected. We just have the part that where she is. So now we're going to take that and we want to average that layer. And it gets, that's the average. That's the average of all the colors in this area. That's fine. Why do we do that? Because we want to use this to colorize the subject below so she matches the background better. So we just simply set the blend mode for this layer to color. Now you're probably saying that's a little much. <laughs> yes, that's more of the right tone, but it's too much of the right tone. That's because it's at 100%. Now that you got it 100%, you can dial down the opacity to whatever you like. I go all the way down to zero. She's too red. She's too orange. She's two of those colors. If I go up a little, oh yeah, now she's starting to look like the background. She's starting to look like that scene. So in her, her shirt wouldn't be that bright in this light. So you're basically making the light match the subject. Okay, um, hope you got that. Is that cool? All right, let's quick, now that we've, we've talked through it, let's quickly do it again on the other image. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn off all of these layers. I'm gonna go to our layer here that we had earlier. Now she is on a blue background, not teal. And I'm gonna go ahead and just move her over. Oh, she is about right, okay. And now we're just gonna walk through it quickly. So select subject. It selects all the way to the edge. It, I don't want it to select all the way to the edge. Lasso, hold down my option or alt key. Give myself a transition area. Now most of her hair is filled in, so I don't need as big of a transition. Subtract the transition area from the selection. Now, all the hard edges are selected. The transition area is there. Go to select a mask. And select a mask is already right here. Boom. And we get an afro. But now we don't want an afro. We want to dial it down so we can see what we're doing. We want to go to the refine edge tool. And we want to brush from the background in to give us back the hair we missed. Just like that. And once you learn it this way, you'll see just how amazing selected mask can be and how helpful it is. All right. So now, last but not least, decontaminated colors is already on. 
By the way, decontaminate colors has a slider, so if it's doing too much or too little, you can adjust it. New, and by the way, we can now see the transparency, see what it did. Ooh, I don't like that. I don't like that little shadow there. So I'm gonna go to this tool, um, adjust my brush to be bigger. And we're gonna go ahead and turn, just remove that shadow area. Just take that out of the equation. Okay. Uh, and now we get a, a great looking um, cutout easily. And we can use smart radius. We can use a little smart radius range. We can just make that even tighter and cleaner and click OK and we get our new layer, new layer mask. All right, next, now uh, we're going to go ahead and duplicate this. Hang on one second. Sorry, I had a fan kick on that shouldn't be on right now. I'm going to go ahead and turn. I don't. I just don't want you to hear the noise. Let's turn that fan off. There we go. All right. Um, now we're going to go ahead and select her like we did before. Hold down the command key. Click on the mask. That makes a selection. We go to the background. Command J. That puts that part of that selection on its own layer. We move that up above her. Not above everything. Just above her. We average it. We then set the um, blend mode to color and dial down to taste. That's too much. Dial it down. Usually around the 30s to 50s is where I usually end up. It's where it's not too much, but it's just enough. And that's before, too bright, after, a little dull like the background. Okay. Uh, Rod saying this is definitely on my uh, rewatch re list. That's awesome. What's the difference between normal radius and smart radius? Um, so smart radius tries to do the right thing with selecting hard edge, like the sweater, and soft edge, like the hair, and just make that make that cut out a little bit better. It, with the technique I first showed you, you really don't always need it, but sometimes I add it just a little bit, especially around... I'm more adding it for the hard edges to make sure I got everything just right. Okay, um, and if your subject does not need, uh, here, let's turn this one off for a minute. If your subject does not need hair, there is a way you can do this. Uh, meaning your subject doesn't have hair, not the subject doesn't need hair. Your subject doesn't have hair. I'm gonna go ahead and select all of these. Oh, I didn't duplicate her layer, by the way, to fill her hair back in, but you would do that, Chip. I'm gonna move her over. There we go. And by the way, I could also put these in a group so they're easier to manage. And we're gonna go back to turn that group off. Oh, oh that should go into group two. And we're gonna go to her and turn her back on. And then we'll duplicate her layer just to do the fill in so you can see that as well. And just look at how it filled in the hair. It just does that magic. All right. Um, and then we'll, um, we can put all of her layers in a group as well. So all of those, group those together. So now we have subject one and subject two easily to turn on and off and move around. All right. So let's go to subject one again. And what if you have a subject that doesn't need all that um, work? Here, let me switch libraries for a second I had a guy in here that was kind of fun Let's see if I can find him there he is <laughs> this was also on Adobe stock I just had to get this image it's just so cool on this background look at that look at the hair going through that by the way let's go ahead and make him smaller and right click while we got him here oh wait hang on, hang on. undo undo let me pull him in without it. Without a, I don't want him linked to the library, so I'm going to go down my option key and pull him in. That way, he won't be linked, and then I can scale him down. Look, I can fly. Right click, flip horizontal. So now she's looking up him. She's looking down her. Cool, and he doesn't have any hair that I have to worry about. So what can I do instead? Well, I can go to the properties panel and just click. Then one new button, remove background, just like that. Done.
Now, if it missed things, because it's using select subject, and select subject isn't always perfect, like I think it cut off part of a shoe, then it's a mask. All you have to do is go back in with the brush tool and go to white color. And no, 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 we don't want your shoe missing. Oh, and I see this line from her mask. We can also paint that out. Um, just make the brush smaller and just bring back in his shoe. So absolutely, if there are things missing that select subject or remove background didn't do right, you can always fix. Okay. And we would adjust his color as well to match, but you get the idea. Um, there was one more thing I was going to do while I was talking about that. We did the shoe. We did the tie. There was something else I was going to do real quick. I just I already just escaped me. Oh, well. It's going to bug me now all day until I remember what it was. The mask, that, 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 that. Oh, her. Yeah, her group. I knew there was something. So if we go to her group. Because we moved her over to the left, it gave us this line we don't want. And I don't know if that's on both layers. Probably. It's probably on both layers. It's more on that layer, though. But it's on both. So we just go to our um, layer mask on both layers. And we want to switch to black paint. And we just want to use a brush. And just... It's not going to completely disappear because it's on both layers. I'm going to get it off that layer. And then do the same thing on the other layer. What am I doing here? What am I what am I missing? Let's turn them off for a minute. I just want to make sure I'm doing these. You know what I'm gonna do? There, I got it. Okay. I just merged it. Oh <laughs> wrong layer. Duh, you're on lighten. There we go. Okay, there we go. I'm like, why isn't this going away? Because I left the blend mode for the brush on lighten, and that was saying, hey, it's not dark darker. I'm not going to lighten it for you. Okay. Now we turn him back on. And you get your cool, crazy composite. Yep. <laughs> Tim already said, you're still on lighten. Your brush mode. Good catches, guys. You're absolutely right. So, by the way, whenever something's not brushing or not doing something properly, check two things. Is something selected? So, I already did the command D while you weren't looking. Nothing was selected. Well, next, check the brush settings to make sure they are what they're supposed to be on. So, in my case, it was still on light and from before and not back on normal. Okay. Um, we can save this um, out just in case. Yeah, we can do a save as, actually. And we'll save it to the computer for now. We'll save it to the desktop and we'll call it Adobe Live Composite. Alrighty. So now you know how to cut things out properly. Let's go back to Lightroom. Now I'm going to show you a tip for, um, for my Instagrammers out there that shoot portraits. I have two images here. I have one that I was further back or zoomed out, click, more of the background, great. I have another one that was more of a tight crop. If I were to post this on Instagram like this, you've seen it, you, you, you export this or you use Lightroom Mobile, you share it to Instagram and you get the little double arrows to make it bigger, but you're still not going to, it's still not gonna fill in portrait. For whatever reason, Instagram, when are you going to fix that? But like, you're still going to be cutting off part of the head or the legs. Because un unlike landscape, with portraits, it does not go all the way out to the edges of the image. I don't know why. What's weird is that portrait 
on Instagram is set to a 4x5, 8x10. So if I go 4x5, 8x10, this is what the crop would look like on Instagram, even zoomed all the way out. So I could say, oh, no, we don't want to cut our head off. We'll just cut our foot off. Yeah, that's great. Let's do that. So we don't want that. And there's no way around that in Lightroom. But there is a way around that in Photoshop. So uh, actually, let me undo that crop. Uh, undo. There we go. Undo it and go back out and edit that photo in Lightroom or any photo like it. If the background is not crazy, then there's an easy fix. I can go to my crop tool and in just a second, by the way, we're going to take a look at your um, your entries on uh, Discord. Go to the crop tool, set that aspect ratio to 4 by 5 8 by 10 just like Instagram. But there's an important checkbox. I want to turn on Content Aware. Because when I turn on Content Aware in Photoshop's crop, it says not only will I allow you to crop in, but I'll allow you to crop out and I'll make up the difference for you. So I can go over here and say, well, that's what I really want. I want all of my image, but I don't want any white space on the left side. I just want all of my image to fill my Instagram. And when I let go and click yes, I don't want this. Or Photoshop, do your thing. Just thinking about doing this thing. And it did its thing. That's it. It seamlessly gave me the rest of the background I needed to make this a 4x5, 8x10 for Instagram or even a print. Maybe I want this framed and an 8x10 frame. And I don't want to crop off important parts of the subject. So she gets to keep her foot. <laughs> it's important. She gets to keep her forehead. It's important. And we just fill in the rest automatically with the crop tool instead of you having to do it th with three or four other steps. Now, if I save that, saving it down here behind my head, there's the save progress bar. Once it's saved, I'll then be able to um, go back to Lightroom, close it, go back to Lightroom, and it will put it right next to the original, all eight by 10, four by five, ready to go to Instagram, ready to go to print without you having to figure out, oh God, I don't want to lose her foot. Oh God, I don't want to lose her head. And away we go. All right, we're having a blast, but it is that time where we go take a look at um, some submissions. Hopefully we have some. So if you're not aware of the Daily Creative Challenge, uh, it's happening every morning, I believe at... 9 a.m. Pacific time, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, right before I came on. So 9 a.m. to 9.30 uh, every day is a challenge. And that way you can um, go in and see what the challenge is over on Discord and for, in the Photoshop channel. And you can find all about that, by the way, in the Adobe Live. There's a link to it, I believe. Uh, yep, join the Photoshop Discord. It's very, at the very top of the chat there. And that will let you... Um, jump in and see everything that's going on. You can get help. You can see what the current challenge is. You can ask questions. You can see tips and tricks. You can get career advice. Ask me anything. All of this is part of the Discord channel for Photoshop. So I'm on the Discord channel. I'm in the current channel challenge. Here's the past challenges. And you can kind of see what people are doing. If I go to the current challenge, again, I'm not sure if there will be anything here yet, but we can look at what is here and we can I can render. Okay, so people are starting to do their uh, day seven challenges where they're combining multiple frames together for their Instagram. In this case, they just made a frame, set of frames. Uh, same thing here. They're slicing their images up and making them ready for Instagram. That was the challenge. Use the slice tool to slice up images and uh, create this look. And there's a video that goes with this. Cloudy um, did, did I think she was the one that did the challenge this morning, if I'm not mistaken. If she wasn't, whoever did it, showed how to do this. And then you can go do it to your own images. So these are pretty cool. Uh, let me go up to the top here. I think that was the first one. So this was um, the Camera Raw Challenge, part two. Using Camera Raw to adjust the image. 
And I'm going to go in now and look. Camera raw, camera raw. Now we're up to the slices. Okay, I kind of like this. I can click on it and make it bigger. Cool image. I like your slice treatment. Here's the before. So not only the slice treatment, but also some nice color treatment to it too. Awesome work. All right, I'm not sure what this is. Just pointing these out, okay. L giving a little bit more space in between the frames. I would probably, just my opinion, it would take it take it or leave it, I don't care, it's up to you. But <laughs> I would, I would probably cut that white space in half. Like I like what you're going for there, just making it more separated, but it's, it's just in my opinion, a little too spaced. So maybe cut, divide the difference and move them a little closer together. Uh, but it's your image, you, you know, if you like it the way it is, that's all that matters. All right, same thing here. Now on this one, for whatever reason, that amount of space didn't bother me as much. But on the other one, I just they, I think they would look better closer together. This one actually looks okay with that same amount of space in between them. And again, it's just literally a personal preference. There is no right or wrong. It's whatever you prefer. That's the before, that's the after. Okay. And here's the slice job on it. All right, so my, my advice here would be don't slice the type or don't have the type go across one of the slices. So move your type up or down or move the slice up or down if that's on the actual building. Because uh, it just is, it becomes a distraction when the line is going through it, not in a not in a good way. Uh, so I would just again, great job. I would just make sure that's above or below the slice line. This one's cool. I like the fact that you used a different color, black. Uh, it makes it stand out more. And again, the space doesn't bother me on this one because of the contrast in color. Very cool. Nice. All right, and these are these look like other challenges. Original image and a very, very small original image. And this is another before and after. Very cool. That's the before. I definitely like your after. So your after is really nice. I like the color treatment on this one. Were you guys all told to use, I noticed you all use like purples and reds. Was that part of the challenge? Uh, good job. I'm just wondering, like, was there a specific color mention that you were supposed to use? Because notice how they all have that kind of reddish, not that one, but like this one too. They all have that kind of reddish look to them. Same thing here. Same thing here. Like, is that was that part of the challenge? Just curious, but no, I, I like it. Definitely like it better. I'm a fan of purple anyway, so can't go wrong with purple. All right, so again, you can participate in the daily challenge every morning, um, Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. You can watch who's ever doing the challenge, watch them uh, show you how the challenge works. And then you go create images and upload them here for feedback like I just gave, and people will actually give you written feedback. You can ask questions. If you're not sure about something, the person that did the challenge usually monitors it. And they can tell you um, in like better advice based on what you what you submitted. So don't uh, don't forget about the daily creative or daily Photoshop challenge. All right, Claudia's influence. <laughs> okay, so that's why everybody's using the purple. Claudia knows I like purple, so she must have knew I'd be watching. Kidding. All right, uh, let's switch back over. Okay, I have like maybe seven minutes left, five minutes left. Let's see if I can do something else really in that time. I'm seeing some back. Oh, here's, here's, this is a fun one. Okay. Um, one of the, one of the difficulties in photographing people with glasses is you end up with glare. You end up with something from your light source or something reflected in the lens uh, that you tend to not want. So um, the way around that 
if you have the option, if you if you've already shot it, there's not much you can do. You can try and remove it, but if you have the option to, um, you're doing the photographing, you can go in and say, okay, I'm going to take two pictures of you. I'm going to take one with your glasses on. Click, but you tell them when I take this picture, don't move. Like literally, act like a statue. Don't move. Don't breathe. Don't think. Don't move. Then you have your assistant because you can't move either with your camera unless you're on a tripod. So either be on a tripod or have an assistant. You're going to stay in the same exact spot. I wasn't on a tripod on this, so it does move a little bit. And you're going to have your assistant assistant go right to the person and do this. They're just going to take the glasses off without moving the subject. Just straight off, not up, not down. Just straight off because that come, they come off the easiest that way. Once they do that, you take the other shot with the glasses off. So I have two versions of this, that, that one and that one, that one and that one. Um, she moved a little both times, but that's okay. Because I can now take both shots and combine them. Uh, let's go ahead and take uh, both of those and Command E them to open them up in Photoshop. And get out of the crop tool. And uh, they're both open as separate documents. And I want to take the one without the glasses and put it on top of the one with the glasses. So this is the one without the glasses. I'm going to grab my move tool. I'm just going to start moving the image until I get to that tab. When it switches to that tab, don't just let go because nothing will happen. And then pull down on the image. Okay, so now they're, they're both there. All right, next. You can select the layers and you can uh, I want to do, I want to do, hang on, let me get this. I'm just going to convert that to a, a layer. You can auto align the layers. So it will try and figure out as best it can the alignment. So when I auto align, brings up a dialog box, and I can say auto, click OK. And if it did a good job, then she's right on the money. But again, she's not exactly in the same spot, so it did the best it could. But now I can go ahead and take the image that's on top, and let me um, let me just select that image on top. Let's zoom into it, by the way, and let's uh, lower the opacity. So I can, because what I'm looking for is the eyes, and the eye placement is the most important. So auto alignment almost got me there. I'm going to go ahead and tilt this image because she is slightly tilted. I'm going to line up the eyes as best I can. Zoom in a little bit more. Get the tilt right. Get the alignment as best you can. You can use your arrow keys to nudge it while you're in free transform as well. Yeah, there we go. Got it aligned. Okay. Now, we'll zoom out and we'll say, uh, yep, commit to that. And we will now hide that layer behind a mask. So option click, alt click to hide that layer above. So it's still there. It's just got a completely black mask over it. Next, we're going to go ahead and just simply with a brush um, and um, white paint, white color. We're just going to go ahead and paint out. I'm checking my brush, making sure I'm normal. I'm just going to go ahead and paint out that glare. Did I do this backwards? I did this backwards. Hang on. Sorry. Like That should not be happening. We're going to put that layer on the bottom. There we go. So let's get rid of that mask. Delete. There we go. We want the layer with the glasses on top, actually. Not on the bottom. So we just switch the layers. They're already aligned. And now we'll add a mask to that one. There we go. But we want to actually now that hang on. One sorry, sorry folks. We want it to be a hundred, but we don't want a completely dark mask. We just want to add a regular layer mask. Delete, 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 delete. 
I could have inverted it, but there we go. Okay, now we add a regular layer mask to it. There we go. And now we're going to paint in black because we're just going to hide that glare, just like that. Now, again, the alignment's important. Otherwise, you're going to end up with the lines and the eyes not matching. So you might have to just paint the whole eye back in or parts of it. But that is, oh, I went too far there. But that is one of the ways to get rid of glare is to simply paint it out of the image with a mask with the non-glary version on top and then crop it to what you want. Okay, so with that said, guys, it is that time of day. I am going to say goodbye because if I don't, I'll get cut off anyway because <laughs> the show ends. There's another show coming up. So with that said, um, thank you for joining me. Thank you for being here on this special day where we're kind of all remote and filling in. Um, it's, it's great to be able to do these streams. It's great to show you guys my workflow, my status, and what you guys do. All right, or what I do, and you guys can take from it what you will. So with that said, cheers, everyone. Thanks for watching, and we will catch you on the next one. Bye, everybody. See you.